Hello, and I'm delighted to welcome you back for the second episode of our new series, Don't Do This at Home. And today we will deconstruct quite a legendary watch with the Rolex Submariner. Yep, you heard me right. And we'll do so with our good friend, Peter Speak Marine, founder of the, the Naked Watchmaker, a website where you can find some other interesting deconstructions. Don't hesitate to visit his website. So off we go. And as mentioned, we will now grant a little privilege to our patrons as they are, or oh, you will be able to see the full version of this deconstruction construction on our Patreon page, link below. For all our other good YouTube friends, well, today you will be able to see the first part of this uh, deconstruction and only in a few weeks we will uh, publish the second part. So don't really like this idea of reserving content. I'm here to share as much as possible. And I like the idea of open knowledge, but I really think that it's, uh, it's normal to give a special treat to those uh, that are supporting us because ultimately we all benefit from it. So don't take it bad if I split this uh, like this. And we should all be uh, thankful to the patrons of the Watches TV for for their contribution that seriously helped make uh, this possible. And of course, don't hesitate if you want to join our Patreon community, link below again. It's like YouTube, but even better. Anyhow, enjoy and remember, don't do this at home. Today, I'm going to deconstruct a modern Rolex Submariner. The Submariner was originally designed and made in 1953. Uh, this particular version is a modern version which was originally sold uh, in 2014. So the case has marks of uh, tarnishing, scratches and general wear. It is the, the daily work of the daily watch of the, uh, of the owner who has been kind enough to donate the watch for this deconstruction. The first thing that I will do is remove the strap so that we can access the case back and then access the movement. Small details, but even the spring bars on this watch are more robust and stronger than in almost any other watch I've ever worked on. We remove the bracelet and place it to the back of the bench. The, the next stage, or the next step, is to remove the case back. Now, the case backs on Rolex have a special key. Now, I've already loosened this one, so it's just a question of unscrewing it by hand, and then the case back comes off. On the inside of the case back, we have all of the, the branding and the references for, for the model. And on the back of this particular one, there is a there's the, the client's initials and his company logo is engraved. The very first thing that we see on the movement is the, the rotor, which dominates the, the highest level of the caliber. On the case, you have the black ring, which is uh, the rubber silicon ring, which is, the, which is instrumental in sealing the case back against the center of the watch, so the watch remains water resistant. This, the pusher is part of the setting lever. The setting lever holds in place the stem and when the stem is pulled, when the stem is in place, it then activates the setting mechanism. So I'll lay the watch flat, press gently down on the pusher and then we can pull out the stem with the crown. The Rolex Submariner, like all of the Oyster cases, the, the watches are, are water resistant. And this in particular, as the, as the name implies, is a watch, is a diver's watch, is the Submariner. And it has what is called the, a triple lock. You have a, a seal, which is at the base of the crown, so that when the crown is screwed in, this acts as a seal to keep the watch water resistant. There is also a seal on the outside of the tube, which is here, but another two seals that placed one against another, which is in the inside of the tube, which is here. So the combination of all of these elements together make the crown probably the crown and tube system probably one of the most effective when it comes to producing a, a water-resistant watch. The stem I will put back into the watch once the movement is outside of the case. Then to remove the movement, there are two screws. 
which are fairly unique to, to Rolex. One is here, on this side, and then you have its neighbor, which is uh, on the opposing side. What is interesting with these, and it's a small detail, but it's a nice touch, is that on most watches you have either a single screw which holds down, or you have a screw and a, a bridle which holds the watch in the movement in place inside of the watch. With Rolex, they have these two screws which are effectively unscrewed to tighten up the movement inside the case, pushing the movement down towards the bezel. So to remove the movement, we actually screw them tightly down into the main plate on both sides, and then that actually liberates the, the movement. Not to come out, but so that it can turn. So that the screws, the casing screws, which hold the movement inside the case, are aligned with the cutouts, the milled out sections in the case, which allow the movement to fall out. And then gently turn the watch over, and then by lifting up the bezel, the movement will then remain in place. It's a very simple thing, but it's a, a nice touch, it's very strong, the screws have a very strong construction, and it simplifies the, the process of dismantling the watch movement from the case. Now we see the, the movement <coughs> without the case. And the first thing that I'll do is replace the, the winding crown. When removing the stem to the movement, I do not need to press the button on the other side. I can just push the stem and it just slots in place, facilitating the process of assembly. So we have the movement outside of the case. And then you see the movement. Now, the next step is to remove the hands and then remove the dial. To remove the hands, I will turn them to all be aligned together. I always place the plastic over the dial to protect the, to protect the dial when I'm levering down on it and also to prevent the hands from being ejected into orbit. As I understand it, the hands themselves are actually made in white gold and then rhodium plated afterwards. To remove the dial, so there are two screws which are screwed laterally into the main plate. and then the dial simply falls off. You see the bare metal of the underside. You have the references again, the Rolex, and it's the reference in relation to the dial. All of the little millings which are inside of the dial, these are the backs of all the indexes which are placed onto the dial on this side. They are all milled down. The indexes are then have two feet or three feet which are then pinned into the dial and then each one is riveted with a pyramid ended punch to be able to ensure that it never moves. So all mechanical, there's no, uh, there's no brazing, there's no cement used, it's uh, made for life. On the dial side there's actually a large disc that covers the whole of the main plate which is probably to ensure that the winding crown is actually placed in the center of the case. Everything is well positioned. Um, this version is without a calendar, and sometimes they come with calendar. So the calendar version, I would imagine, has extra thickness, and the plate then balances up for the lack of the calendar. The, um, the next step to be able to dismantle is to remove the automatic block, which is the automatic rotor with all of the automatic mechanism. So the, the automatic block is held in place by two screws. So I'll remove the two screws 
and the entire block will then be freed. So that whole mechanism, that all of what I've just taken off is all part of the automatic. It winds in both directions. The pinion which I'm pointing to here is the pinion which drives directly the ratchet wheel which is above the barrel. To dismantle or to remove the rotor from the, um, the bridges is actually very, very simple. Very nicely designed. There is a little clip system which is here and you have a little hole and you move that hole to one side and then you can simply remove the whole of the block. And now you see the rotor with this axle in the center and the rotor is completely free. The outside of the rotor, this section here, is all made from hard metal, tungsten carbide, for, for weight. It's held in place by these three rivets. Then you have a thin piece of metal in the side with these cutouts. And the cutouts are there to form, uh, form, of, to form a, a type of shock uh, resistance or shock protection. So that when the watch gets knocked, and as a sports watch it will get knocked, the actual axe in the center is protected. So all the force caused by that knock and that, that heavy metal mass is taken by, is absorbed by this section opposed to the actual axe. The axle itself is riveted in place within the watch. And historically, from experience I had many, many years ago, one of the only parts of this watch which actually wears is that rotor axe. And then every um, seven to ten years, that axe is then removed and a new one is then replaced. And then you have the, the rotor block. To dismantle the rotor block, you turn it over, and then there are three screws. And then I can take off the lower bridge. And then underneath you see the two reverser wheels and the ratchet wheels within them, and the wheel upon which the two of them mesh which is this piece. And this is the one in the pinion which is here, which then winds directly the, the ratchet wheel or placed on top of the barrel. These are the ratchet wheels inside of the reverser blocks, two identical. And then on the inside, you have a little anchor system which allows that wheel, that this tiny ratchet wheel, to move only in one direction. So in one direction, the rotor winds up the barrel, and in the other direction, the other reverser wheel winds up the barrel via the wheel which is meshing with the two of them. And there's a little steel pinion which is here. That pinion where it has a, an, an olive shaped or an oval shaped hole cut out of it is what then meshes with the, the rotor and then all the force of that rotor turning around then pushes on that pinion and then in turn is pushing on the the other automatic rules. There's no need to dismantle the, the little clip system. That can remain as it is. On top of the bridge, you have all of the Rolex engraving. Geneva, Swiss, Rolex, 31 jewels adjusted to five positions. The bridges are, are decorated. The all of the engraving with the numbers is then filled or rather plated with a yellow gold which is then protected and then all of the other surfaces in rhodium plated. Then the protection for the engraving is removed which then reveals the yellow which then gives you this nice contrast between the yellow and the, um, and the white or the chrome color of the rhodium. You couple that with the the rubies, uh, the synthetic red rubies, and uh, the diamond cut angles 
and you have a very nicely finished, uh, industrially finished, mass produced finished, but a really quite a beautiful component. Okay, so now you have the movement without the, without the automatic mechanism. And now that the automatic mechanism is out of place, we can let down the power. This is the, the ratchet wheel, which is right on top of the barrel arbor, winding up the mainspring. Next to it here is a small jewel, which in turn associates with this wheel, which is then part of the automatic mechanism, which sits on top and then drives, winding up the ratchet wheel, which is here. This is the click, which prevents the power from winding down. And on the other side here, you have two wheels, or two pinions, which can manually wind up the piece. But when the automatic, automatic mechanism is winding up the ratchet wheel, this wheel here, or this pinion here, is then pushed to one side. So it only engages when you actually wind it up manually. To let down the power, move the click to one side, and then gently, whilst holding the stem, release the ratchet wheel. To continue the deconstruction, the dismantling of the movement, I would take away the, um, the balance, because it's the most fragile part. So what Rolex have done here, which is a nice touch, is they have what I've called a, a balance guard, which is this bridge, which is around the, the, the balance. Now, the reason I believe that is there is that if the watch was to receive a, a knock when it is fully assembled and the rotor, which is large, that has this he huge heavy metal tungsten weight on it, the whole thing will flex. And to protect the, the assembly, the balance, especially the stud, which is here holding the balance, that rotor could then uh, knock down and touch that guard and then in turn protecting the whole of the balance assembly. It's, it's a nice pragmatic uh, solution, very simple to a potential problem for a sports watch. So yes, this is where we leave uh, our good friend Peter, and if you want to see the full version, well, this is available for our plus five dollar patrons, and please remember that there is uh, nothing binding with Patreon, you can stop whenever you want, not necessarily what I want, but that's another subject. So thanks for watching, see you real soon, and we will nevertheless publish uh, the second part of this video in a few weeks. But if you can't wait, well, you know what to do. Link below again. All the best, thanks for your time, uh, see you real soon. Send me, 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 me,